the Citizen Bike Show. News. Commentary. Interviews. Citizen Mike Show starts now. How do you want to do it? Just we'll cut that out and we'll just start in. I can just start it over. No, we have to start it over. I mean, whatever's easier. Yeah, uh, we'll just start it, and you'll excise out the five seconds that. Yeah, that's that's good. Okay. Welcome to the Citizen Mike Show. Thanks for tuning in. We do appreciate it. My name is Mike Burdinsky. This is the episode for April 20, 2018. On my right, the one and only Ralph Tomaselli, the editor of the Record Journal. Ralph, we are still broadcasting uh, from uh, Community Pool here. Yeah. Um, we said we would move our location. <laughs> We never did. I like it. I, I'm okay with it. Um, the next time we produce a show, we may be in the Middle East. Yes. Yeah, that's we right. may be in the Middle East. Um, right. I'm taking a trip there yes. uh, in basically two days. Going to spend tays there, uh, ten days there, and uh, we'll be back with some photos. Good. So that's we'll good. have a little. Yeah, that would be great. You know, a little uh, a slideshow. While we're talking about programming uh, notes, um, we have Ned Lamont coming on the show in two weeks. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then on May 30, the May 30 episode, uh, we're going to have Jonathan Harris oh. on the show. Both are the leading gubernatorial, the Democratic gubernatorial right. candidates. Um, Susan Bicewitz is, uh, is, not, is not at this point scheduled, and I guess if she heard that, those comments, said, wait a minute, I'm the leading. Right. <laughs> well, I'm the leading, but at any event, Jonathan Harris and Ned Lamont are coming on the um, Citizen Mike show. Um, so let's do a little bit of a follow-up to the story we spent a lot of time on mm -hmm. last week. And it's a serious story because it involves the future of this rare cicada, maybe, right. maybe. Um, and for those that watch the Citizen Mike show, we don't have to recreate the entire story, but in general what we're talking about is All Next has a big parcel out there, uh, um, Route 5, on the southern part of, uh, of Wallingford near Tully's Road. They want to break off a 25-acre parcel, sell it to a guy who's going to um, start a sand processing facility, mine out all the sand. Um, and as you pointed out last show, and I want to spend a little extra time on your point, the, the hope and aspiration of this developer is to build a great big new building after the sand is taken out, uh, which would result in a lot of taxes to Wallingford, even the sand processing facility would too. Mm -hmm. The point you raised uh, last week, and maybe we should have spent more time on it, but I'm going to do that now, is what happened to the tax promise if that right. building isn't built because right. it isn't as economically feasible or, you know, but, but right now I got to say it appears as if be, it's being planned with serious intent because of things like traffic studies and, and all that kind of thing. But you raised that point last week, so I want to get it back, okay. back to you. Um, how concerning is, th is the notion of an empty tax promise? Well, it is a concern, and, 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 and I don't doubt anybody's intention, Yeah. but as we discussed last week, to predict commercial real estate or commercial development five years down the line, it would seem to me, presents some challenges to anybody. So then the, the issue can become, for, um, for folks that are already skeptical of this project, right. 
is approving this application for uh, approving the application that would allow the sand processing facility to go in, which is um, some have said an, on unique habitat and sort of a, a special spot according to, to their view in in Wallingford in Connecticut. Um, if the application has to be judged just on the sand processing part because the other is too speculative, right. um, how serious is is that adjustment of our, in our thinking? If I, I don't know if I made my question clear, but I. No, I think you make it. Yeah, I think it, in other words, can you know, it, can the sand processing facility stand on its own? Uh, you know, and 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 a excellent point. Yeah, and I just think that the town needs to to have to be prepared for that and what yeah. if we don't get any further than sand processing you know what do we get out of this i mean what do we get out of this compared you know if we only have sand processing compared with sand processing in a building what's the difference well last week after some teeth pulling on my part right you came out in favor of this application, in favor of this commercial development, but you may have changed your mind. You may have weakened. I read the editorial page too. Right. So, well, I think what happened <laughs> yes. since we last talked is ah. something I actually predicted at the end of the show, okay. which is that I don't. It, it's it's become to me also an issue of transparency. Yeah. And so when I read. The mayor saying that there's no environmental concerns, and then in the same breath saying, and he's referring to a report, and then conceding that he's never read the report, now we're talking about transparency, good government. And then on top of that, we've got the environmental, the town's environmental planner. Do I have her? Yes. Okay. As you predicted, I think you predicted, the, the town's environmental planner having no idea of what the mayor is referring to. So that's not the way I want government to operate, where the mayor knows something, but the environmental planner doesn't. I mean, that doesn't seem to be the best use of tax dollars. And, and then on top of that, you have apparently the planning department asking for the report that the mayor's heard about and not getting it but being told that the planning commission can ask for it. And so now this project concerns me, nothing to do with sand, nothing to do with commercial buildings, but to do with government transparency and government process. So holding your nose, mm -hmm. holding your nose, right, and ever so slightly, uh, you know, knowing that it's not a clear, you know, a slam dunk, are you still in favor enough of the project despite this bad behavior? I'm going to, that's my editorial yeah. comment, uh, you know, by the mayor and by, by, and by the developer. Yes, Are because you? I am, because okay. I think that most of the bad behavior is on the part of the mayor, um, and it's not anything necessarily out of character for the mayor to, to <laughs> okay. be saying, well, I know things that you don't, and you can't know these things. I mean, it's, it's, we get a lot of that here in Wallingford. Not, you know, it, it seems like only a small group of people are entitled to know things, because apparently if the rest of us know them, I don't know. Things will go haywire? Yeah. Uh, let's let's yeah. uh, let's bring the story up yeah. to date yeah. um, with some uh, good reporting by Matt Zabrick of the Record Journal, who... Um, after we did our show, um, not because we did our show necessarily, but after we did our show, um, was around town hall and interviewing right. folks and got some uh, talk to the mayor, obviously. Um, and what he, well, this is sort of a summary of what he reported. The, the headline is, Mayor rebuts environmental concerns over development, but offers no proof. That's the headline. Not going to read every sentence on it. Um, but Mayor Dickinson um, said that the developer who submitted an application to the Planning and Zoning Commission to develop a 25-acre parcel of land on all next USA's property had a study done that shows the area's sand, barren, and dry, acidic forest habitats are no longer uh, viable. And uh, the story goes on to, to, to quote the mayor, and the mayor says, well, the uniqueness, uh, 
uh, is no longer there, according to the mayor. Um, and he says, well, apparently it was unique, but there's no findings of any of the unique characteristics that were believed to be once there. But in saying that, the mayor is relying on a report that he never read. And the person who shared that report to him had every reason and motive to spin it. Right? Because there is a financial, a financial interest in getting this project done. You look a little aghast. Well, no, I, I absolutely. No, I, I yeah. agree with that. And I'm starting to wonder, I don't want to like get too conspiratorial here, but I'm wondering if the mayor intentionally hasn't seen the report for some reason. Well, I, think, I think that's a possibility. Okay. Uh, let me go through the article a little bit more. Okay. And then uh, Dickinson didn't provide any details, uh, didn't provide uh, uh, many specifics about the studies he referenced during the meeting on Tuesday. That's the town council meeting where on the record he talked about a report he never read. Um, but he said in an interview Thursday, mm -hmm. good job, good job, uh, Matt Zabrick, his understanding is that the applicant had a multi seasonal analysis done as part of their due diligence. Um, I haven't seen it, but that information has been mentioned, and I think it's only fair that people know uh, the information is out there, he added. And um, therein the problem begins because he's trying to guide and mold public opinion on the basis of an environmental study that he refers to in public in a most authoritative way, yet he hasn't read the study. Excellent That's point. the, and, and that's the, the only, problem. Right. You know? And the only thing that I'd add is it yeah. just shows you what a master politician the mayor is. Yeah. And he could actually use the word fair. Yeah, right. He thinks it's only, here he is saying that he knows something, but he doesn't really know it. And he says it in public, and he's, but but he's trying to be fair. That just show, and you know what? The majority of people who follow the mayor, I think, buy that he's trying to be fair. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's the scary part. So speaking of scary, uh, Matt Zabrick uh, talks with Aaron O'Hare, the environmental planner, who reports to the mayor. The mayor is her boss. Okay. Yeah. And and Aaron O'Hare, to her credit, um, shows a uh, a lot of guts. A little bit like Nikki Haley, by the way. But absolutely. that's another story. That's no, another no, story. Absolutely. <laughs> um, calls out the mayor uh, for for doing what he did. It's like calling out your your boss. Um, and so I'm going to put a little of my own right. attitude into okay, this. Yeah. This is you know who knows how right. Aaron O'Hare said this, but the mayor would be advised to. If he wants to characterize the physical attributes of this property, it would be better to get all the information from different sources before one jumps to a conclusion, Mr. Mayor. I, Mr. Mayor was my. Yeah, right. Before one jumps to a conclusion of what is or is not supported by these habitats, so on and so forth. So, in no certain word, um, she calls him out. I got some comments on the uh, the northern dusk singing cicada, which I know is very dear to your heart, and you formed a bond with these critters. Um, but any thoughts on Aaron O'Hare? Yeah, and then we'll then we got more details. But right, that's fine. Want to get to the oh, uh, more thoughts on Aaron? On, here. Yeah, just that we are um, we are extremely fortunate uh, in government to have employees like this who really do risk their own position. Yeah, for issues like transparency and openness. And uh, and and talk about someone who's not, you know. Here's the mayor saying he wants to be fair. Well, why doesn't he be fair to Aaron O'Hare? Yeah. So um, some of the environmental um, interest groups have weighed, many have weighed in on this and written letters to the file, the planning and zoning file, and they become a um, a public record, of course. And uh, one of the one of the insects. Um, that allegedly is taken up residence there is the northern dusk singing cicada, the largest cicada in North America. And if you read, you know, the reporting and these letters quickly, it creates the impression, at least to me it did, and maybe I read it too quickly, that the northern singing, the northern dusk singing cicada is somehow endangered or rare or, or threatened. 
Um, we just wanted to check into that. And okay. here's what we found um, online. All right. um, and Bruce, we got a JPEG. If you could throw that up. This is a, uh, a map that gives the, uh, the range of the northern dusk singing cicada uh, according to uh, this website, uh, which is a 2018 publication by this website. And it's called um, Songs of Insects. Um, I read it, I looked it over, it didn't look like it was fake news to me. It didn't right. look like it, the Russians okay. sent this over, right. you know, uh, to influence right. the election uh, on, on cicadas. So, the, the cicada has a wide range, uh, mostly in the south. So, we in Connecticut, I would opine, mm -hmm. don't have to be too worried about the survival of the northern dusk singing cicada. Well, I didn't want to rely on just one website. So, I went to another one. Uh, Bruce, you can... Well, no, leave that up. Leave, Bruce, leave, leave that up. And this is another uh, website, which, you know, has information on this, on this bug. And it talks about its, its range. Um, and it says, despite the common name, the cicada is the, most, the, is the most common across the south. Um, it's in extreme northern Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, Kentucky, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia, where it's common. Right moderately abundant in the Midwest, the Mississippi, the Mississippi uh, River Basin. Uh, also moderately abundant in the Mid-Atlantic, uh, including uh, the Mid-Atlantic states, including Maryland, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and New York. But it is rare, according to this website, in Connecticut and uh, in Massachusetts. Let's take, that, let's take that down, and I got some questions for you as my expert. Good, good. So, where does this leave, this, this um, interchange uh, uh, through Matt Zabrick between um, the mayor and Aaron O'Hare and, you know, this report? Is the Planning and Zoning Commission now kind of boxed in? And if they insist on this report, and the report is not all it's cracked up to be, mm -hmm. if the report is not consistent with what Mayor Dickinson said, Yet, it's the Planning and Zoning Commission, which is dominated by Republicans, right. although it's not thought of uh, typically, uh, you know, as, as partisan, but politics is in everything. Right. Um, does, is the Planning and Zoning Commission now kind of in a box that they don't want to insist on getting this report? Because if they get whiff that the report isn't what the mayor said, they've embarrassed the mayor. What do you yeah, think about that? Yeah, wow. I, I think the Planning Commission is in a difficult position here. I think there's this issue of the report, and I I think that if they don't ask for the report publicly, you know, they're going to take a lot of criticism. So, so there's that aspect of it. And, and then there's the aspect that you raised on the last show, which is how does a planning commission sort through competing reports? That, that might, like, you, like we, we first we criticized the mayor for not being transparent about the developer's report, but then there may be issues with what the quote-unquote environmental side is saying also. How do they sort through that? So I'm, I was trying to think in preparing for the show, which, you know, right. takes me a long, long time uh, right. all the way. I'm trying to think, so what could happen? What could happen? What could happen that we should watch for? Okay. And one possible outcome, there are many, one possible outcome is that, surprisingly, the Planning and Zoning Commission, you know, a majority of three, decides, well, this report isn't all that important. And even though the word environment shows up in our regulations as something to consider in connection with a special permit, what it really means is environment outside the boundaries of the property. Uh -huh. We don't really care about cicadas and sand plains. And, and besides, development means destroying habitat within the boundaries of a property anyway. I mean, you have right. a coal mine, you destroy the, the right. ground. You no, have a gold no. mine, you destroy the... So this really isn't our in our portfolio. This really isn't something that we should... Uh, get, get bogged down with if the state of Connecticut is that serious about saving the habitat and the northern cicada, you know, the, uh, the state of Connecticut can do that, presumably, although we cast doubt on that on the last show. Mm -hmm. I hope, I hope sufficiently. That's, that's one way of doing it. Right. The other way of doing it 
uh, or the other way, that, uh, another thing that could happen is the Planning and Zoning Commission asks for it. Hell, insists on it. Mm -hmm. And the developer says no. And there's three votes in favor of the project anyway, or at least at least three votes in favor of the project anyway. Okay. And this way they get the project. The mayor's not embarrassed. I mean, you don't get it bog, bogged down in a battle of environmental experts. Um, you know. Uh, well, and, and, and that's just two. I mean, no, there's other possibilities. There, there, there there's other, other possibilities there, there is other too. Possibilities. Yeah. I mean. If you don't have a really transparent, open process, don't you risk, isn't there more of a risk of, or I guess the question is, is do you increase the chances of legal action after you make a decision? Well, someone would, um, if, if someone's application is, is denied, um, you know, there would have to be appeal. That would be Rusty Rogers. He would have to appeal, appeal a denial. But there's other reasons for the Planning and Zoning Commission to deny an application. I mean, it's not just this. But, I, but the answer generally is, yeah, I suppose. Well, I think the I was more thinking controversial about, I, it I was is, thinking uh, about it the other way. If oh. they approve it yeah. and they don't give the environmental side at least a fair hearing, Yep. Isn't there more of a chance that they might? Well, um, seek other give me uh, give me fifty thousand dollars, and I'll research whether an environmental group has standing to right. uh, to raise an appeal. And I just don't know the answer to that. Okay. Um, maybe the state of Connecticut might, but I don't know if it would. The the other thing is yeah. is that, and I think we're going to get to this is 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 it possible to for the planning commission to try to thread the needle here and and make everybody happy yeah so let's get to mary mashinsky's okay. uh op-ed um okay. you it was in your paper there take the lead on what what did mary mashinsky say and what didn't she say well in in the piece that she put in the uh the record journal about this right i mean it she seemed to be against the project I'm not so sure. Well, I think the the thing that the the reason Mary wrote a you know about a 400 500 word piece and okay. she starts out with the the hist I really enjoyed the history okay. of uh, she goes all the way back to George Washington's um, uh, observations about the sand plain and then comes up to the future, but I think that what Somewhat intrigued me was the lines in the op-ed that say, the developer and applicant have shown interest in protecting part of this parcel. So let's grant the application. Right. Let's so, approve it. In fact, in the next line, let's well, get, no. Uh, so, so this is a welcome development. That is a welcome development. I don't think she's referring to the overall plan. Oh. Um, but perhaps some, Mary Mashinsky goes on, perhaps some of this rare habitat can still be saved and people can learn about the time only 15,000 years ago when Wallingford was covered by an ice sheet a mile thick. So what's she saying? She seems to... She, she knows something we don't know? Well, she seems to leave the door open. I mean, it wouldn't be the first time that somebody develops a piece of property and in return for that does something for the environment. It, you know, so all, it could be open space. Sometimes people are asked to do so. She seems to at least open the door to that. Well, I, I just don't know, um, you know, this area of compromise. Could there be a bomb dropped at the Planning and Zoning Commission at, at their hearing where Rusty Rogers comes up and said, and says, and there's three acres. Right. Out of, 20, out of 25. There's three acres. I promise not to disturb. Right. And could be he wasn't going to disturb it anyway. Right. Yeah? Right. And and then uh, Mary Mashinsky, the environmentalist and planning and zoning commission feel better about things. Right. And they say, oh, that's a nice compromise, and now it's approved. Seriously? I mean, I'm having trouble after all of this. Right. Um, you know, believing that's, that's going to um, assuage everyone's consciences. But I'm still unclear. Is Mary Mashinsky saying grant the application because we can trust them to save this right. symbolic three acres or or maybe right. it's more maybe it's less or maybe mm -hmm. it's none 
um, we trust them to save the cicadas, or is she saying just deny it, or is she trying to have it both ways? I, I, I'm puzzled. Yeah, and I, I can't I'm answer puzzled. for Mary, except yeah. that, um, like I said, she does seem to have this threading of the needle, perhaps, in mind, but yeah. I don't know what she knows that, that you and I don't know. Uh, let's talk about AquaTurf. Okay. Good idea. Let's talk about AquaTurf. It's been in the news. Yeah. It made the Hartford Current. Yes. The front page of the local section. Yes. I think front page of the Record Journal. At least twice. Okay. So the short story of AquaTurf is that um, the NRA had its, had a, I think the local NRAs uh, had an annual dinner there. Friends of the NRA. Friends some, of their NRA. Some kind of state group. You're well, right. they were careful to distinguish between the Washington, yeah. D.C. Yes, they were. You know, high-rise office building, right. lobbyist NRAs. Right. And they, it, whether that's a legit distinction, I, I have no I opinion on. But they had a dinner there uh, at the AquaTurf. And apparently, there they got a uh, the AquaTurf got a lot of flack on social media. Right. I haven't looked at that myself, but that that's been reported. And so the AquaTurf, which is a like a banquet venue in Southington, right. um, decided that they would no longer have the NRA or the friends of the NRA um, there for their for their events for their for their big events, and that caused a bit of a kerfluffle. Enter Ralph Tomaselli on my right. What was their kerfluffle, and right. who, who sided with the NRA? G good. Okay. Yeah. And just uh, the, this issue was raised mostly via social media, though we had some people contact us at, at the newspaper. Um, the Friends of the NRA event that the AquaTurf had hosted uh, for about. 20 years or so, was occurring on the same day as the national protests um, in response to the Parkland shootings. March for our lives, right? right? Okay. So, so some people, you know, drew a connection between a local business, a protest against guns, and the Friends of of the NRA, and there's one other layer to this, which is the AquaTurf is a popular prom venue. So the AquaTurf in May will be having all these high school kids coming. So, so that was kind of the connection that people drew and protested. I also think some people saw a connection when there wasn't one in this sense. Okay. I think these dinners, such as the NRA had, have to be set up way in advance. Oh, absolutely. you got to reserve, good, good put down point, a deposit. Yes. I mean, this is hard to organize. Right. And the march had to have been set up long in uh, advance. Uh, and it was just bad point. luck for the, for yes. the AquaTurf you are that it ended up on the same day. Excellent uh, point, so. and an important one. Um, so the Hartford Current um, reports um, on Wednesday, this goes back about a week, uh, the article does. Scott Wilson, the president of the 20,000-member pro-gun Connecticut Citizens, uh, Citizens Defense League, said it's, um, he, they're, he said they're, they're going to abandon the AquaTurf. They're not going to go there anymore. Right. And um, he said, the, this is a war, he said, uh, against the Second Amendment. Of course, you know, th that group is, I, I think, kind of famous for over-the-top rhetoric. Right. Um, but canceling of, of this was a war on the, on the Second Amendment, and they're not going to go back there, and they're trying to get their membership to, you know, I don't know what. Um, and then a war of words began, which continues online, you know, to this, to this very day, even though now it's old news. But my question for you, Ralph. Yes. What about this notion of these commercial or economic boycotts or strikes against those organizations that host or sponsor other organizations that you don't like? You know, this whole economic yeah. warfare thing. So like Bill O'Reilly for a while lost right. advertisers. Uh, Rush Limbaugh was hurt um, right. deeply. I don't think he's ever recovered. Um, because there was a boycott against his sponsors. Right. Uh, and it goes on and on. I mean, there's been a more recent example. And, and those 
those on the right just don't like that kind of tactic, although I would say they kind of use it themselves. But I'm going to get your thoughts. Yeah, first thing for just a little background. Yeah. The, the AquaTurf, and maybe because I work for a, a local family-owned business, so, so I'd like to add this layer, which is the AquaTurf is owned by the Calvinese family, a local family that has run that banquet facility uh, for decades. They're not some... Um, out of town entity or conglomerate you know they're they're a local family that employ a lot of local people and run probably one of the largest charity organizations in the town of Southington so I, I guess I'm getting to that um, because as certainly as I judge the aquaturf and as it conducts itself I'm taking that into account um, that said People are certainly entitled to economically boycott to make their point. And, and um, I empathize, I have to admit, I empathize with the AquaTurf here because they're kind of getting it from both sides. Um, but people certainly are in, entitled to do that. And it's... Uh, well, so I'm going to try to pull some teeth out of you yeah, again. Two, two shows in yeah, a row. Yeah. I'm going to try to... Yeah, pull some teeth out yeah, I'm gonna pull some I, teeth. if I'm equivocating. So if you're the owner of the AquaTurf turf and you could yeah. do it all over again, would you make the same decision? You've lost the NRA and now you've lost another, you know, the CCLD or something or DL. I don't, you know, I think that the AquaTurf's main concern was probably proms. If, I, if I'm just guessing yeah. that if I'm in that business with everything that's going on with high school students, I would be concerned that if I hosted NRA events that I would lose proms potentially. So I, I think I probably would have done it the same way. Okay, let's talk about salt on the roads. Yep, salt on the roads. Salt on the roads. Salt on the roads. Story in the Record Journal. Okay. Lead sentence, I think, tells it all, then I'm going to go to you real quick. Mm -hmm. Mayor Dickinson allocated an additional $82,000 for road salt in his 2018-19 budget proposal because he says it's uncertain whether the town will receive state grant funding for snow removal and other road work next year. I'm going to ask you to assume the mantle of his defense and his logic, if you can, or, okay. or, or no, any, any reason. I've been, any I've been very harsh on the mayor. Yeah, I want you to defend what he's saying, and then I'm going to okay. mop up after you. Yeah, no, I'm, I think. I, I think you can. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Um, certainly, the legislature, by, you know, not passing a budget anywhere close to on time last year, put municipalities in a really difficult position and again this session they are behind uh, on the budget process I don't completely understand it um, and it's the, the mayor is not the only one who is very confused as he puts together his budget for the next fiscal year. How well, did, I think that was a pretty good defense. Um, no, not at all. Okay. I mean, I, I consider everything you said, I consider to be the blah, 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 okay. blah of, of the story. I just want to know why it is that okay. the state of Connecticut is going to cause more snow and ice next winter. Whoa. See, That's what I want to know. So the mayor didn't, uh, the, the, you know, the mayor is uncertain of his budget, therefore it's going to snow more. Well. Well. Right. I, 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 I want you to unpack that. Right, I'm trying. Okay. I'm trying. I know I you can't because it's totally illogical. You know, I think the mayor, he can't possibly know the amount of snow that's going to fall. No, but he's, he's, he's adding. He's trying to plan. He's, he's, he's predicting more snow year. and ice by saying I need $82,000 right. more because the elements are going to be harsher next year and it's all Governor Malloy's fault. I think. I mean, I, I, I know, you talk about weather forecasting. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I think the mayor has some reason to doubt but to that take has, a shot at the state okay well and and that may not be answering your question right but i think in my defense i'm 
My lead sentence would be, Mayor Dickinson on Tuesday accused uh, Governor Daniel Malloy of causing more ice and snow during fiscal year 2018 and 19 because he's been slow with his budget and that most certainly will cause us to use more uh, road salt. Yeah. And, and uh, when interviewed, uh, Vinnie Cervoni commented, I certainly agree with the mayor, right. you know, they, you know. I, and, and what, I mean, I, and I, I worked on this story too. Matt oh. wrote it, but I worked on it. And I, I think that. I just walked into the mouth of the well, dragon. Well, no, it's okay. It's, it's just, yeah. it's, it's, it's good that, you know, I, I sometimes work very, I work very closely on a lot of the stories. Yeah. And that's actually good. And I think that I really was the one who emphasized more in the lead, possibly the headline the mayor's frustration with the state because I found that to be a little more interesting than $82,000 for road salt. So I got one final item. Okay. Well, let me, no, I, I, I can't leave this without, yeah, a, yeah, no, without, a, without a, without a parting, without a parting shot. Um, the next time the mayor does this, yeah, and he blames increased ex expenses re directly related right. to the weather or building repairs or the need for police officers or need for fire departments. And there's an increase in, ex in expenses because we have more fires or right. we have more crime or right. we have more sleet and snow. You can't blame that on the state. Right. That's an expenditure. I mean, I... Right, and, and I think sometimes I, the hope is, too, that... And, and, and seriously, yeah, I think I the hope is too that, you know, people, I think a lot of people probably arrive at that conclusion. So how are schools doing? And how would we know whether they're doing well or not? Well, I mean, tests are one way, certainly. Tests are one way. The, the state has a, um, a, like a matrix mm -hmm. where they consider the test scores of every school district and every school, but not only the test scores, there's a lot more criteria that they use to try to come up with a, with a number score. And then by using the same matrix, the same criteria year after year after year, they try to, uh, this got to be the Department of Education, although I'm not that familiar with the, with the, with the nitty gritty details. They try to track the progress of school districts um, year over year. And it, it is of of some use if you're trying to figure out if the school's on the right track or the wrong track, although two robins do not a spring make, two years of test scores, you know, right. do not a trend make, but it's not useless information. I mean, it, it does have uh, some bearing. Well, according to the Connecticut Mirror, which is a very excellent uh, website for, for state news, right. um, state uh, grades the uh, uh, every school district and three quarters see a drop, and it um, in the lead sentence, a large majority of public schools and school districts in the state earned worse grades this year than last on the state's annual assessment of school performance, according to data released Friday by the Department of Education. The state's 0 to 100 grading system takes into account more than a dozen measures, that's what I was searching for there, including standardized test scores and how many students are chronically absent, enroll in arts and advanced placement courses, graduate from high school, and enroll in college within a year, within a year of graduation. So Wallingford slipped a little bit. Yeah. Eight out of the uh, 12 uh, schools in Wallingford slipped a little bit. Um, the remainder went up a little bit. The state overall went down a little bit. I, I mean, it's just something to make note of. And when this comes out again next year and the year after and the year after, don't forget the Citizen Mike show that we did, you know, in April 2018. And if and someone on the Board of Ed ought to, ought to raise it and, and not just sort of sweep it under the rug. Well, it's just an isolated year. There could be real questions, I don't know, um, raised by this sort of a trend. Your thoughts? You know, I... I think all the points you made um, are good ones. I have to admit, though, I am a little sometimes just blinded by the test scores and data that school systems put forward. And, that, and that's probably a cop-out, but I, I, it's hard for me to sort through it and figure out what it all means. Yeah, well, I think it's fair that there be some sort of accountability for school board superintendents and individual school buildings. Absolutely. That accountability has been very 
hard to define and measure and and implement. Uh, this is one tool, uh, you know, just one tool, but it's it's something that's uh, that's out there. Okay. Wallingford slipped a little, not a lot. Uh, I think we went down two points from something like 76 on a scale of one to 100 down to 74. The, the the criteria and what this all means is maybe for another show when we have a okay, board of ed good. you know member to sounds good walk us through all this kind of stuff. So. Let's make that the final word. Okay. We are going to be off for two weeks in a row. Yes. We're going to be back on uh, the May nine show uh, with Ned Lamont. After that, we've got uh, one or more town councilors coming in. The budget will have been passed, and uh, we'll see what some of the councilors have to say about it. And then at the end of May, we have Jonathan Harris coming on the show another gubernatorial candidate and you know after that the uh, gubernatorial campaign be off and right. running mm -hmm. thanks for tuning in the citizen mike show we appreciate it we are here ralph and i on wednesdays and now at eight o'clock but you can see the uh, citizen mike show on thursdays at nine fridays at nine monday tuesday wednesday at nine on wpaa to get there, WPAA.TV on your computer, or go to YouTube and search the Citizen Mike Wallingford channel and follow all the appropriate links, and you can get us up on YouTube. Or if you let me know, I can send you an email with a link that gets you directly to the Citizen Mike show. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Good night.